This is a wonderful day. My name is uh, Gerald Bast. I'm the president of the University of Applied Arts. Proud to be the president of a university who is dealing with uh, change. Uh, changing uh, times, we, we're living challenging times and uh, the term we of, often hear is change, which is kind of a diminishing term, uh, looking at what we have of kind of challenges. It's not a normal change, uh, uh, stepping from one side to another. It's really dramatic what we are facing, and this is just the beginning. Uh, we in Austria, in Europe, are looking on uh, the situation of uh, migration, uh, thousands, uh, maybe millions of people are uh, running away from hunger and war, uh, looking for a better life in Europe. And some people think uh, this is just one single uh, situation, like uh, a volcano uh, erupting in Iceland and uh, then we have for some months uh, kind of chaos uh, and then uh, normality will come to our social lives again. This is not the case. This will be not the case. Migration and other changes, other reasons for changes uh, will be part of our lives, a part of our economies, a part of our politics in the next years, probably in the next decades. Just looking what is happening in Africa. If you compare this, the refugee situation we have now is just a little thing. In, in Europe, we live in a, in a situation where more than half of our population uh, are living in cities, in urban conglomerations, not that big, uh, like we have them in uh, Asia or in South uh, America, but they live in cities. And uh, living in cities is attractive, but the more it is attractive, the more it is challenging as well. And the solution we often hear is the word smart, smart cities. And the solution of people who uh, talk about smart cities is, okay, we, uh, if we have a problem in security, uh, we increase uh, digital video surveillance. If we have a problem in traffic, in, uh, in public traffic, we increase uh, mechanical uh, industrial devices uh, to have a better technical planning of traffic. And maybe uh, in some years we will have uh, uh, traffic without uh, people who have uh, to sit on the steering wheel. Uh, this is a super solution. Uh, and if we have a problem with uh, an aging society, with people who uh, are becoming older and older and therefore in the aging times suffering more and more from uh, various uh, problems, uh, health problems, we have medicine. So we find some kind of medicine and this is the solution. All these things are not the solution, or let me say, are not the only solution. Of course, we need technical uh, innovation. Of course, we need medical research. Of course, we need uh, things who organize our, uh, our cities. But what we really, really need is on one uh, side the contribution of the arts, of the creative class, as someone said a few years ago, already a few years, some years ago, uh, implementing not only 
digital, technical, technological devices into society, but also implementing creativity, implementing the arts. And if I talk about arts, I mean uh, fine arts, music, design, architecture, and so on, and so on, dance. Edward Wilson, one of the main uh, researchers in evolution biology, uh, wrote in his recent book, his probably big last book, he uh, is the grand old man of uh, uh, biology, uh, he wrote about uh, the arts and the role of the arts in evolution and he said there wouldn't have been this kind of evolution without the arts. Participating in the arts actively and in form of uh, a recipient is and was a necessary part of human evolution. And we live in a time of dramatic revolution. Some people say this speed of changing in our society, in our world, will never be so slow like we face it now. And it's rather quick right now. So, having all this uh, kind of uh, environment, uh, looking at this situation, we, this wonderful university, uh, reacted. And we reacted by organizing, implementing, starting uh, a study program and master program in social design, arts as urban innovation. Arts as urban innovation. This is title and program of this study course. We react on this situation with uh, symposia like this we uh, have today. And I'm really proud uh, to say that uh, this afternoon a new initiative will start organized by the University of Applied Arts. Looking at this recent situation of migration problem, we call it, and it's called in, in the media. Uh, looking at uh, uh, this really helpfulness uh, of politics we are facing. Looking at uh, the situation that a lot of people are engaging themselves in refugee homes, uh, in, uh, uh, on, on railway stations, giving uh, food to refugees, uh, uh, preparing beds and blankets. Our students and our teachers also were and are involved in this kind of engagement. And the last weekend, 100, more than 100,000 people were in one of the most prominent places in Vienna, uh, giving a signal that refugees are welcome in this uh, country. And listening to a lot of artists, musicians, uh, giving this uh, uh, signal to the world. But all this is not enough. There are a lot of artists and scientists who are thinking and working about what we could, we should do in this situation. But the problem is they all are kind of isolated, which is the system of the arts, which is how is organized the system of sciences. Isolation, fragmentation, separation. And we cannot continue this system if we want to contribute, at least contribute a little bit to these kinds of problems we have now. And therefore we want to make a small contribution. We open a platform. This university is opening a platform for artists, scientists of any disciplines. 
and we give them a platform for their contributions on the topic of migration. Philosophers, people from humanities, people from sculpturing, from media arts, from video, from music, uh, from uh, uh, biology and from medicine are called to contribute and we will give them a platform, an online platform where they on one side can publish their ideas and their contributions, their projects, which need not to be uh, perfect uh, projects, uh, and uh, where we will give them the opportunity to connect to each other, because it is necessary to connect people who are looking in the same direction and to overcome this fragmentation and isolation in the area of the arts and the scientists if we want to move to a better society. I'm very proud to be the president of this wonderful university and I'm very happy to have you here on this uh, symposium and I wish you a fruitful and interesting discussion and lectures. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues and friends, thank you, Gerald, for the introduction. Um, I think when we started to program um, this event, um, and Gerald was actually addressing it uh, right now, is that we didn't expect this fast pace of change we're actually facing uh, right now. So um, I think. What we can see, and we strongly believe, that we are actually facing, uh, let's say, tremendous turnovers. Uh, we have been facing last time by entering, let's say, the industrial area. So, I'm really delighted to welcome all of you to our second international symposium within the social design framework, um, entitled Urban Change. It is the follow-up symposium uh, of public action and it is really with great pleasure that we again welcome several distinguished and inspiring scholars and practitioners. They came all the way from US, China and Europe to join us as speakers at our symposium. Oh sorry, I moved something. No, it's not working, so please, I'm not Benny. <laughs> Benny is sitting over here, so don't worry. My name is Anton Farkas, <laughs> and um, since I'm uh, the curator of the symposium, um, I have been asked to introduce the general topic of the symposium, and I will briefly unfold what I, yeah, um, unfold um, what, he, what I started to say. Uh, the course of history of the city in the urban age from the Industrial Revolution to the Knowledge Society, actually discussing the key factors of urban change in history. So I think it's evident that the Industrial Revolution marks a major turning point in history. More or less every aspect of everyday life has been influenced by this development up until the present day. Modern societies as well as modern cities are rooted in this period of radical transformation of work and life. Fueled by the progression of industrialization, rapid urbanization started to change the concept of urban environment completely. So the quote keys, this caused substantial damages to urban space and broke apart pre-industrial societal structures, end of quote. Establishing this production process as a core value empowered uh, the linearity of progression and sort of unraveled complexity into a chronological order. So this means consequently linearity was established as a fundamental principle, crucial for all transformations to follow. Integrating large-scale technological intervention, inventions into the production chain actually significantly changed the production routine. As a consequence, spatial 
concentration of labor established a new type of urban structure, what we used to call the industrial plant. So this means that site and location evolved as the essential criteria. Traditional production techniques defined by spatial coexistence of life and work actually dissolved into spatial dissected concentrations of monofunctional activities. Executing this strategy on an urban scale led to a yet unknown and radical segregation of urban life. Thus, isolation and exclusion evolved as core policies of the functionalist city. Organized alongside linear processes, the city developed, followed, the, the city development followed the path of a solely economical practice. And this urban model gave birth to one of the main consequences of the modern world, mobility. So by means of technology, of technological invention, so to say, it became feasible to increase the velocity of movement. The velocity of machinery replaced the velocity of the pre-industrial transportation systems. As a result of industrialization, and this is crucial, automobiles appeared on the urban agenda. And they finally gaining the biggest influence in urban planning to date. They became the driving force of city development. So once populated by a variety of activities, streets and public spaces of pre-industrial cities now faced the re reduction to traffic only, depending entirely on car mobility. Cities have developed into sprawling urban forms. So the develop, this development of uh, rapid suburbanization has had a big and long-lasting impact on urban, but as well as societal structures. So during the development of the industrial society, technological progress and innovation amplified the production of wealth. An increasing income became a common circumstance of life in Europe, as well as the industrialized Western world. Other parts of the world, however, remained stagnant, and this led to a great difference in living standards, and this is what we actually see uh, still violent today. As a result of the Industrial Revolution, growth became an important factor of urban life. And the theory of growth, finally the driving force of economy. Moreover, the speed of material processing and the huge turnover of energy and labor led to an unprecedented decrease in natural resources and to unbearable pollution and destruction of the environment. Alongside this development, new parameters were established to define and measure the changing urban landscape. We call it the ecological footprint and let me say the, urban, the, 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 carbon, the carbon currency. Throughout history, urban space um, has been framing activities, defining territories, forming and transforming communities. To be a member of a community meant to recede within its territorial boundaries. So this concept of community was directly related to a face-to-face -face communication and to what I would like to call a hand-to-hand distributing arrangement. So both of them are clearly operating on a physical level. Less than a century after the advent of the Industrial Revolution, the next wave of radical transformation appeared. While the physical abilities of man and animal defined the pace of the pre-industrial world and the velocity, um, now the velocity of machinery, those of the industrial and industrialized world, the speed of the electromagnetic field is now defining the rhythm of urban life and questioning the very notion of distance. So this means boundary-spanning technologies are restructuring social identities and spatial practice. By creating techno-social situations, aspects of urbanity 
have been substituted by new media technologies. Let's say especially interactive technologies have been changing our notions of personal and social space, transforming the world we live in into a heterotopian place, actual and virtual at the same time. Thus the implementation of the World Wide Web as a new means of communication has had a substantial impact on everyday life and city and society and streets and public spaces. <coughs> so while societal services of public spaces are transformed to media activities, the disappearing visible communication structures are deleting the traces of interaction. Invisible telecommunication networks overlaying the contemporary city have become, in terms of communication and interaction, actually more important than the built environment. New communication structures are simulating communication services of the city's structure. So this means street and public open spaces, the, let's say the key elements of the European city, are fragments of a visible communication. So they are spatial notations of a face-to-face -face communication behavior. However, extensive and rapid developments in the area of information, capital and population have led to the emergence of a new social and societal formation. We call it global cities. Digital technology and social logics can, according to Saskia Sassen, produce a third condition that is a mix of both structured in electronic space, we call it digital formation. Digital formations are co-evolutions of organizational forms and interactive technologies. They are managing the shift from hierarchical, bureaucratic concept of mass production, as well as mass media, to networked forms of production and communication. This shift from brokering knowledge to facilitate, from brokering information, sorry, to facilitating knowledge indicates the, the transition from an information society to what we could call a knowledge society. And this concept of the knowledge society emphasizes immateriality and specific intangible features of products and services in economic progresses and of innovation in particular. So to quote the European Commission, innovation is our best means of successfully tackling major societal challenges such as climate change, energy and resource scarcity health and aging, which are becoming more urgent by the day. Therefore, our future standard of living depends on our ability to drive innovation into sustainable products and services, social processes and models." End of quote. So I think the basic function of knowledge is to provide the capability to act. The Knowledge Society is asking for new conditions of knowledge production, new channels of knowledge diffusion, and new methods of knowledge utilization. Today's societies are facing an urgent need to manage such processes by new and more efficient ways of information processing and knowledge production. As a consequence, how cities perceive the modern uh, our society, sorry, how society perceives the modern world is increasingly defined by theoretical knowledge. But knowledge, unlike information, cannot exist independently of, um, of a subject. It is primarily represented in science, technology and innovation. It has taken over the place of industry and agriculture as a key factor in economic and urban development. So, once again, rapid advances of technologies are sort of restructuring and redefining communities and markets. Again, the quote Saskia Sassen, 
just as industrialization served to disadvantage rural areas, so too might the global information economy in the future cities, which benefit greatly from economies of agglomeration, will have an even greater advantage over non-metropolitan areas than they have today." End of quote. Now, urban change has become synonym for global challenges in the urban realm. Water shortage, energy, scarcity, climate change, global poverty, or refugee crisis, how the media tries to call it, just to mention a few of them. All these concerns are colliding head-on in urban agglomerations. Since cities in general are condensed descriptions of urban life, consequently, they are focal points of global challenges too. They are complex systems that can no longer be understood as spatial entities. They behave more like living organisms. Like amoebas, today cities grow and shrink under the conditions of continuous change, where the rigidity of form and program has been replaced by an open system in which growth provokes conflict and disorder, and ultimately change. So cities and living organisms such as amoebas share the capacity to establish an ephemeral physical integrity while remaining unstable in their basic conditions. However, this, let me call it biological vision, is unfortunately not the vision that has been guiding our contemporary city development so far. Urban growth in the 20th century city planning did not involve models of interaction. It was not at all expected to be evolutionary. City development so far was not based on strategies similar to those employed by living organisms. Therefore, the, the planned city was unable to operate different activities simultaneously. On the contrary, I would say, segregation, fragmentation, and exclusion are the precise counter model of a system where diversity provides the resources for change. The system lacked flexibility, failed to open up the design system, and to keep conflicting elements in play. So the city has grown far beyond its initial definition, which has not been commonly recognized so far. Consequently, there is a discrepancy between how the actual city operates and how it is perceived by the efficient planning authorities. So while Asia and the Pacific region are facing a fast-paced paced megalopolitan progression, and I think we will hear a lot about the, um, of the situation in Africa too, but let me say that in Latin American countries are suffering from the consequences of a rapid urbanization. All of a sudden, and I think, find this quite interesting, um, uh, that the informal urban structures are appearing in the public and, public and, and published perception and in the planning documents of the city development because these were originally white spots on the maps, especially on the maps of Latin America. And these are now being visualized and sort of officially acknowledged. However, this change is not the consequence of an altered perspective for politicians and city planners, but the abrupt emergency of a political reality. Informal districts have reached a critical mass, and the number of inhabitants has become an electoral factor, which is perceived as such by the political calculus. So over the last decades, urban agglomerations have been extremely successful, and I think we know all about that, in absorbing population growth and drawing in rural population. So as a result, the world's population started to concentrate in urban agglomerations. The World Urbanization Prospects, which is published by the United Nations, 
is really expecting that, and I'm going to quote again, urban dwellers will account for 86% of the population in the more developed regions in 2050, end of quote. So this means, as a result, cities are increasingly <clears throat> put, put under pressure due to densification, concentration, population, economy, capital, and media, as well as culture and knowledge. So instead of discussing new qualities of engagement, we still believe in outdated models of urban development. Even in the context of the European city, the planning instruments provided are barely functional to anymore. In view of informal urban agglomerations, they fail completely. So this means top-down and bottom-up strategies actually colliding head-on. So in order to do justice to global processes of change, we should understand the informal as a laboratory in which new instruments can be developed that treat diversity as a resource and that enable transformations. This means new unexpected strategies are required in order to synergistically overcome old oppositional situations. The city model of the 20th century remains a closed model that failed to support and open up the contradictory <coughs> and conflicting elements. Segregation and exclusion are the results, and as already said, they are still evident to these days. To overcome this situation, we have to continue the discussion on urban change. To develop interdisciplinary strategic tools to address urban challenges. So this symposium will focus on urban transformation in a rapidly urbanizing world, aiming at connecting research and theoretic sciences with hands-on practice of spatial and cultural co-production and, and I think this is crucial, interweaving this discourse into the very fabric of society. So therefore we have set up an intense and diverse program for today, covering various disciplines, or let me call it fields of expertise and practices. The symposium is divided into a morning and an afternoon session, as you can see in the program. So each session will be followed by a roundtable discussion. This morning session is entitled Scaled Impacts. This session will focus on the transformational power of the social, political and culture within the global urban realm. So the first panel will be Benny Banerjee, and now it's working, Shaheen Merali. <laughs> um, they will contextualize the subject, oscillating, let's say, between complex systems, chain theory, the issue of globalization, and the art world. At the second panel of the morning session, we will learn more about how curatorial strategies can intervene in cities. So we have two ways of addressing the social, political, and cultural urban agenda. Sophie Goltz will introduce us to the, to the public space program in urban planning. Pedro Gadano will provide us an insight into new types of urbanism, into tactical urbanism on a global scale. In the afternoon session, we will discuss new conditions of the urban transformation fueled by public interventions and social inclusion. With panel three, we will have a closer look at the Asia and the Pacific region. Anna Greenspan will provide us with a more grassroots approach and Katja Schechtner from a more corporate perspective based on big data and uh, the financing aspect of urban development. And finally, panel number four will add another layer to our discussion. It's Kilian Kleinschmidt, 
we will learn more about the inherent logic of new urbanization emerging from the world's largest refugee camp of Saatari in Jordan, while Thomas Hirschhorn will provide us an insight into um, an art-based into art-based strategies pointing towards a non-exclusive public. So, welcome again, and I'm very much looking forward to intense and fruitful debates as we started it already yesterday <laughs> night, may I say so. And thank you all for, for being here and being with us. Thank you.